How many of you know it's good to be in the house of God? Amen. Amen. Pretty excited about the word this morning. How you can let me know when I'm, when you're ready. I'm ready when you're ready. I'm ready. Like I said, we had a very eventful night last night here at the church. And I appreciate all of the participation with the congregation that was here to help support uh, the youth that came. We cleared this sanctuary out. It was an empty shell space. It kind of looked like the day we moved in. It was empty. And we filled it full of fun and activities. And these youth came in here and they had a good time. We shared a, a word. We talked about Jehoshaphat. We set this place up and talked about how the Lord will help fight your battles. And how many of you know the youth go through some battles? <coughs> yeah. We like to look, think of things as adults and how many battles. How many battles do you fight? As an adult, we fight some battles. But how many of you remember when you was younger? We forget about those days, don't we? Oh, yeah. The youth, boy, I'm telling you, they fight some battles. And the problem is sometimes they don't like to talk about them battles. And sometimes they keep them battles on the inside. And we talked a lot last night on how God will help them fight those battles. Because if we don't teach these young people that God will help fight or God will fight those battles for them then they're going to turn to the world to help fight those battles. Right. Yeah. And that's where the drugs come in. And that's yeah. where the alcohol comes in. And that's where hanging out with the wrong crowd comes in. And that's where all of these worldly filtrations come into their lives. And so last night we had an opportunity to pour into some young kids mm -hmm. to teach them, Chris, that the Lord will help fight Amen. their battles if they will seek Him. And so we had an amazing time last night. I'm going to tell you right now, those kids was pumped up and excited, and we had a, a, a wonderful time. And at the end of the service, Cass asked if we was going to tear everything down or if we was just going to leave the sanctuary set up like it was. And we made the decision just for the functionality of service that we'd go ahead and tear it all down. And this is what one of the youth told me, just to let you adults know the mindset. How many of you know out of the mouth of babes? Come on. Right. One of the youth came up to me and she said, you could leave the sanctuary set up just like it is and preach the same message because maybe some of the adults need to hear this. Uh oh, come on. So I thought about that. But I'm not going to preach the message that I thought I preached last night, even though maybe I should. I'm not going to preach about Jehoshaphat because I've got a message I'm going to preach out of Isaiah today. But just so you know, there's going to come a message about Jehoshaphat and about the Lord fighting our battles that evidently some of these adults need to hear per the youth. The adults need to hear. Amen? Amen. Amen. But this morning, I'm going to preach out of Isaiah, the 8th chapter, starting with verse 11. So if you don't care, I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer, so please pray with me. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to stand behind the pulpit and speak to your people this morning. Father, I don't take it lightly. I count it all joy and I count it an honor. And I pray that you take the coal from the altar and you touch my lips and every word that proceeds out of them be the voice and the words of the Lord. And I pray, God, that I don't speak with enticing words of man's wisdom, but, Father, rather the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Prepare the hearts of the people. Let them have ears attentive to hear and a heart to ready to receive the word that it would not return forth void as the word of God says that it would accomplish that that it set out to accomplish. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Isaiah, how many of you know Isaiah is a prophecy of things to come? And Isaiah prophesies the coming of Christ and some of the things that happen after the coming of Christ. Did you guys know this? Isaiah is prophecy. Isaiah prophesies that the Messiah is coming. He prophesies that Jesus is going to come as the Messiah. And he's going to come and he's going to be crucified. He's going to be the Savior of the world. And I'm studying a little bit in Isaiah over the last few weeks. And I get to chapter 8. And I find some things. I find six things that I find key that I want to share with you this morning. How many of you have ever get, got into a place, or maybe you be, may be in a place in life right now, that you might need some help getting out of? I know I, as a pastor, you know a lot about people and some of the situations that they face and some of the situations that they may be in. And I know that there's a lot of people right now going through and battling a lot of things in their life. 
seems to be a lot of stuff going on, whether it be just situations, life bombarding them with different situations. There may be a lot of sickness. There may be a lot of things going on that's pressing on God's people right now. And you know, sometimes just like this picture, sometimes it may seem like that there's only a thread holding everything together and you're just hoping that that one single thread is enough to keep things from breaking apart. I've been to that place in my life. Sometimes often I get to that point and I'm like, I just hope that this last thread don't break. Because it seems like that's the only thing that's holding everything together. You know, 3,000 years before Christ came, God had dealt with mankind for 3,000 years before this prophecy in Isaiah, between Adam and this prophecy, for 3,000 years. Now, Cass can probably correct me if I'm wrong because he's the one who does. He knows the history. This man is full of the history and the knowledge of the word. But there's some 3,000 years, Chris, between Adam and the prophecy here in Isaiah that God is continuously dealing with the people about the issues going on in their life. They just, they'll get close to God and then they turn from God. And they'll get close to God and then they turn from God. And they, they're just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Back and forth. It's like a it's like a washing machine. You know that thing, it just agitates. Back and forth, back and forth. These people just cannot find their place. And for 3,000 years between these, this prophecy, they're just struggling to establish this relationship. And finally in Isaiah, there's a prophecy given that says, I am going to send my son. And it's going to settle this thing once and for all. And there's going to be an establishment of a relationship. That's it. So how many of you this morning understands because of the prophecy in Isaiah, this is what connects it to you. So turn around to your neighbor and say, the word that pastor is preaching this morning, it's for me. Say, turn to your neighbor and say, it's for me. It's for me. This prophecy, it's for me. So just because it's in the Old Testament doesn't mean it's an old word. That's it. This prophecy in Isaiah was prophesying about the coming of Jesus and what's going to happen after Jesus comes. So this prophecy, it's for you. This is a word that is for you. So I want you to grab a hold of this word this morning. Don't just dismiss it because it's something that you don't understand that's in the Old Testament. I want you to grab a hold of these six principles this morning that I'm going to go over with you. Isaiah prophesied that Jesus, the Messiah. How many of you know what Messiah means? Just I'm just going to throw this little rabbit out here to you. Messiah means champion. Just so you know that. So just so you know that Isaiah prophesied that the champion is coming. So whatever you're facing in your life, not that I'm preaching last night's sermon because I didn't even tell this to the kids last night, but maybe the adult needs to know this morning that Isaiah prophesied that the champion is coming. So whatever you're facing in your life that's got you tore apart to where you look like this right here, Isaiah's prophesied that the champion is coming. So when you look to your neighbor and you said, this word is for me, I want you to understand the champion has come. Come on. Amen. So this word is for you. That's it. You're not going to break. This word is for you. We're living in such a time that freedom is binding. We are living in such a time that freedom is now becoming bondage. Mm -hmm. Because there's no structure. Listen to me for a minute. I'm going somewhere. Hang on. We're getting there. 
There's no structure. There's no formalities. There's no guidance. There's no accountability. There's no consequences. There's no boundaries because everything is just free. So because there's no guidance, there's no boundaries, there's no accountability, there's no consequence, freedom has now become bondage. Isaiah chapter 8 talks about this very thing. Verse 1. Mark, can you please go on my desk and get my cell phone? Because your redneck pastor can't pronounce this word, but on my cell phone, I have a tool I'm going to share with you. Y'all laugh. I've done my homework. That's right. The first verse in chapter 8 talks about the children, the Israel, and they are a certain way. And the Lord labeled them a certain way. Let me see if I still have it on here. Yes, I do. What he said. That's what he labeled him. And let me tell you what this means. It says swift to plunder or to carry away. That's what he labeled the people as. Swift to plunder or to carry away. In other words, these people was anxious and they were swift to anxious. Let's say I was ready and waiting on somebody else to, to mess up so I could have what they had. <coughs> I was just waiting on somebody at the job to make a mistake so I could have their position. I was just waiting on somebody not to be able to make their car payment so when that thing got repossessed, I could get a good deal on a used car at a reasonable price. Does that sound like the world we're living in? Yeah. I was just waiting on somebody to hit hard times so when that house hit foreclosure, I didn't have to pay market price. I could get a good deal on a house. Now, you may not wish that on a person because you may not know them right well. But that's how we shop the market. True. That's how we shop the market. Mm. We're going to get the discount clothes at the Goodwill. Now, I ain't knocking the Goodwill because I buy a lot of my stuff at the Goodwill. But we don't take into realization that it may be somebody that just went bankrupt and lost everything they had. And everything that they had just got donated to the Goodwill. Because maybe somebody had lost a family member. Or maybe somebody just got incarcerated. And their family member just took all of their stuff to the Goodwill. Swift. Is what that God said these people was this is the place they was at in their life. They were swift gas to plunder. We live in a generation of people. We may be the generation of people. We are the generation of people that is always in such a hurry to gain. We're waiting on the next step, the next move to make more, to be more, to be higher, to be the next best. We're never satisfied standing where we're standing. In the shoes that we have. How many pair of shoes do you have in your closet? Come on. And if you had ten pair and you went to the store and you found a pair on sale, would you buy them? We are a people that press and stress over the more. I was having a conversation the other day. Let me back up just a minute. There's a lot going on here in this little church. Yep. 
And I'm going to say this very delicately. I'm trying to word this without somebody making accusations because you know somebody will. A lot going on in this little church. And how many of you know we don't have a full-time pastor? Amen. Right? And that's been brought up at the board meeting. It's been brought up at our annual meeting. And I quickly jumped up and said, no, no, no. It ain't time yet. Right? So first of all, I want to make that perfectly clear before I go any further into this statement. So the youth not come about. Now we're going to have that monthly. Let me ask the congregation a question. Do we have a youth pastor? No. Not yet. No, we don't. So who does the youth night? The part-time pastor. The part-time the part -time, the part -time pastor. Okay. Now. We just went into live praise and worship. We do it live now. We don't do it on PowerPoint anymore, right? And Chris has so graciously helped step up and help me play the piano so I'm not up there playing the guitar by myself. And Olivia, when she's here and not at work or out of town, she helps me play the drums, so we've put together a makeshift band. But do we have a worship leader? No, we don't yet. So who who does the worship? The part-time pastor does. Me and my wife was having a conversation the other day. And she said, and I can't even remember now what we was talking about. And this is what we said, me and my wife said, together. We was told by God to do it until he sends the one that takes the place. If it needs done, do it until he sends the one to take that position. So if I have to play the guitar on Sunday mornings and lead worship, I will play the guitar and I will lead worship on Sunday mornings until the worship leader shows up and says, Pastor, I need to lead the worship. And I'll say, thank you. And I will do the youth services once a month until somebody steps up and says, Pastor, I need to do these youth services because God's burning that in my heart and I will say thank you. You get where I'm going? Amen. Come on. Because I was sitting in a conversation with somebody just the other day that said they're so busy, they got kids, and they've got them involved in some sports through the week. And so on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they got sports that they play and they don't get home until 8 o'clock at night. And what bothered me is they are in leadership in their church, but they can't seem to go to church on Wednesdays because that's just too many activities through the week to keep their kids mm. out late in the evenings. Come on, come on. So church was the first thing to get cut. And I thought to myself, I said to myself, now I can remember when I was growing up. Now y'all may think I'm chasing rabbits, but I'm not. Hold on, we're getting there. Come on. We went to church on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, and Wednesday nights unless somebody was dead, think they was dying, or dying. Those were the three reasons you did not go to church. Because priorities in life was God number one. That's it. Come on. Come your on. family number two. That's it. And then the church. And then everything else came into place after that. Right. In other words, that meant it wasn't God and then the church and then your family. That's not how it worked. It was God was first and foremost in your life, period. And then your family was next. Because then God's, God's first, then your family. So if you've got something going on important, but if God's first and then your family second, you're going to have them in the church house. That's it. Amen. That's it. Just because you got a birthday party doesn't mean you're going to go to the birthday party and you're going to schedule it during church. 
No. What that means is you're going to make sure that that family's in church because they're the most important. That's it. It means that if your family's sick or if your family is in need, my papa used to call it because the Bible says if the ox is in the ditch, come on. Then you would, on the Sabbath, you help them get it out. That's it. So the only time my popo would miss church on a Sunday or on a Wednesday was if somebody was in need. Like if it was an emergency, he would say their ox is in the ditch and I would have to get them out. But we live in such a day where people are so caught up in the game. Oh, well, I got to make sure that my kid is the best on that ball team. Because then that makes me look like the best parent. I gotta live my basketball dream through my kid because you know I'm 45 pounds heavier Come on, and I can't it. play the ball no more right. so I'm gonna live it through my kid Come on, you're preaching. Mm. and it talks about this kind of people in verse 1 of Isaiah yep. and there's a problem with this because <laughs> if you read down just a few more scriptures. The Bible says I'm going to take care of this kind of people. He says because I've got this river. He says and when, when my river is flowing gentle. Verse 5 says the Lord spoke to me and said. My care for the people of Judah. Is like a gentle flowing water. Shiloh. Now, I'm going to stop right there a minute because when I think about a gentle flowing river, what do y'all think about? Peace. I think about purity. I think about refreshing. I think about reviving. I think about laying back with a fishing pole. I think about rest. Right? I think about coming to the house of the Lord and being fed rivers of living water. Amen. Amen. But listen to what he says at the end of verse 5. But they have rejected it. They don't want that. They've turned from that. And we wonder why. Our lives look like this. And we wonder why we get ourselves in situations where we just seem like everything is falling all apart around us. We start running ourselves so ragged. And we wonder why. We don't know whether we're coming or we're going. We don't know whether we're winning or whether we're losing. We don't know whether we're first or whether we're last. We can't even remember whether we're fighting or whether, whether we're losing or whether we're winning. Y'all ever been in a situation like that? Amen. All of a sudden it seems like that we're being bombarded on every side. And the enemy has all of a sudden engulfed us. And do you want to know why? Because we're free to do whatever we want to do. Amen. With no consequence. No boundaries. Come on. Because we don't put them on ourselves. You know, that's the difference in a kid last night and adult, an adult this morning. That kid last night had boundaries. That kid's told when they got to go to bed. When they got to get up in the morning. That kid's told they got to brush their teeth. That kid's told what they can and cannot wear. That kid's told who they can hang out with and who they can't hang out with. That kid's told what's right and what's wrong. That kid's got boundaries. That kid's got rules they got to live by. But something happens when we grow up and we step out from underneath that and we start experiencing freedoms. The Bible calls it free will because God's not going to push things and force things on you you got a free will you get to choose 
And some of us take that luxury to the extreme and we don't put any kind of boundaries in our lives. And we just live any old way. And the first thing we experience is we get way off in left field somewhere. And then we want to know why everything's a mess. Last night we played a game. We had these big circles on the floor. And we put a punching bag in the middle and they had these big old giant blow-up punching gloves, boxing gloves on. It seemed real simple because they had to all I had to do was punch that punching bag outside the circle. Easy, right? Well, then we blindfolded them. Oh, come on. Made it a little bit difficult, right? Oh, but then <laughs> we had two little sneaky individuals that decided that once they're blindfolded, they'd go move the punching bag. <laughs> so then we got video of them. That's like the blind mice trying to find the punching bag. Trying, they couldn't even find it to even get it out of the circle. I mean, <coughs> how are you supposed to win that? I can picture our lives like that as an adult. We get to a point we swing and we can't even find the thing we're trying to swing at. We're so far off in left field. Because we ain't got no boundaries and we're blind, we're lost as a goose in a hailstorm. And if y'all don't know what that means, that's an Alabama turf for you lost. <laughs> you are lost, way out there. <laughs> lost. Let me wrap this thing up quickly, like. Verse 11. There's six points here. Verse 11, 11 through 22. There's six points here, and I didn't pop these things up on PowerPoint. There's six points here that I want to bring out. The Lord tells Isaiah to reel you back in. When you need out of something, there's six points here that will reel you back in. <coughs> the very first point in verse 11, it says, Don't think like everybody else. Let me read it. The Lord has given me a strong warning. Not to think like everybody else does. Woo! That's a pretty strong point. Don't think like everybody else does. Philippians 4 it says, Whatever things are true, whatever things are honorable, whatever things are just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's commendable, whatever's excellent, whatever's praiseworthy, think on these things. The first thing to get yourself back on track is you cannot think like the world thinks. Amen. You cannot think like everybody else does. The world's way of thinking is not going to get you out of your problem. I preached last night about Jehoshaphat. He was attacked by three other tribes that was much bigger than he was. And the Lord told him to stand still, hold your position, you are not going to have to fight this battle. If he would have thought like everybody else thought, he would have lost that battle. Because everything in my mind would not have told me to just stand still. You cannot think like everybody else thinks. We've got to put on the mind of Christ. We've got to shed this carnal thinking. And start thinking according to the word of God. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10 and 5 says, We destroy arguments and lofty opinions that raise against the knowledge of God. Take every thought captive to the obedience of God. If what you're thinking don't line up with the word of God, you need to quit thinking about it. No, amen. Mm -hmm. If the decisions you're fixing to make in your life don't line up with the word of God, don't make that decision. I could drop the mic right there. Boom. If the decision you're making does not line up with the word of God, I'm telling you it's the wrong decision. That's it. It doesn't matter if it's about a relationship, if it's a business decision, if it's a financial decision, if it's a personal decision, if it's a feeling. It doesn't matter what it is. If it don't line up with the word of God, it's not right. Don't do it. Stay away from it. It'll corrupt you. It'll make you look like this right here. It'll get 
get you mentally frustrated. <coughs> if you're a thinker, the monster you feed is the monster that'll grow. Yes, little bitty thought pops up in your head. And if you ponder on that thing, that thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I wonder if they really meant. I wonder if they really meant that about me. And the next thing you know, you've developed an attitude about somebody and you swear they hate you and you're already upset at them. And all they've done was look at you and they may have been having a bad day that day and they didn't even realize they was looking at you. And the next thing you know, you hate them. Hold that thought captive. And if it does not line up with the word of God, throw it away. That's it. Don't make decisions that does not line up with the word of God. Set your mind on things above. Colossians 3, 2. Set your mind on things above. Not on things of this world. If, it is, if you cannot compare it to heaven and it does not equal heaven, don't worry about it. That's it. Let me put something in perspective. Priorities. Hmm. Let me tell on myself good to tell on yourself sometimes, right? I have been drying off with some of the nastiest looking, frayed up, wore out, bleached out bath towels you've ever seen in your life. Looks like rags for quite some time. We've needed some new bath towels forever. Now how many of you just go out, oh I need a bath towel, I'm going to go buy a bath towel. You just don't do that, do you? Well have y'all, you, has anybody bought bath towels lately? They're not cheap. Nope. I mean, you don't pay six, eight, ten dollars a piece for them things. They're, they're, they're if you get them on sale. I found some at Ollie's, and I'm thinking, my lord, there's me and Teresa both. And if I don't want to have to do laundry every day, we're gonna have to get I don't know six, seven, eight of these things, right? Well, that's a lot of money. Six dollars a piece. If I gotta buy four of them, you do the math. What's six times four? That's twenty four dollars. I can't afford that, so we didn't buy them. We went right on down to the Mexican restaurant and paid forty five dollars for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. That's American. That's how we live, guys. That's how we live. That's, how we think. That's exactly how we think. Yeah. And so, guess what? When we went back to Ollie's the next time, we bought some. I think we ended up buying six or eight of them. I'm like, and then get the hand towels too, and I want them all white. I want them all to match, and I want them all white. Get the hand towels, get the bath towels. We just bought wash rags. We don't need wash rags. Buy them all. Just fill the buggy up. Buy all of them. I learned my lesson. But that's how we think. If it doesn't, if it does not match heaven, it don't matter. We get so petty over things. Number two, verse 12. Don't call everything a conspiracy like they do in Live in Dread. How many of you know people that think everything's a conspiracy? Yes. And then they're scared to death over everything. The second thing you can do to keep yourself from looking like this picture is right here is to not live in fear over everything. Amen. The Bible says, I've not given you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. Amen. We do not have to live in fear over everything. You are a blood-bought, born-again child of God. And he has not given you fear, but he has given you power. He has given you love. And he has given you a mindset to know who you are in him. You do not have to live in fear. You can live every day of your life knowing who you are in Christ and the power that you've got because you are a child of God. No weapon formed against you can prosper. That's right. What more do you need to know than that? I ain't saying that you ain't got to go through some heat sometimes, but you're going to get through it on the other side. He's going to get you through it. Ask Tiffany. She's about to make it through this school. Yeah. There's probably some times she didn't think she was going to make it through this thing, but she's just about to make it through the other side of it. Yes. Why? Because no weapon formed against her shall prosper, and she's going to make it through this thing. Amen. Amen. What more do you need than that? 
Joshua 1 9 says to be strong and courageous and not to be afraid, not to be discouraged. That God's going to go with you wherever you go. He never leaves you, He never forsakes you. He's always right by your side. You don't have to be in fear. Oh, well, but the government's doing this and the government's doing that. The government has always done this. The government has always done that. And the government's always going to do this. And the government's always going to do that. But there's coming a day that Jesus is going to come back and everything is going to be okay. We can't worry about what tomorrow holds. You better worry about what you're doing with today. What are you doing right now? Because that's what counts. Jesus is going to take care of tomorrow. That's it. And if you make it into tomorrow, he's got a plan for that day. But right now, you need to worry about what you're doing today. Mm -hmm. That's what is important. Hold it up to heaven. 3, verse 13. Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. Mm. Make the Lord holy in your life. If you don't want your life to look like this picture right here, if you need a way out, you need to make God holy in your life. Sure. What does that mean? He needs to be number one. Not number two. Not number 20. Not just a Sunday morning thing. Sure. Not just a on the side thing. Not just a because I need to have some kind of a title thing. Not because I want to impress somebody thing. Not because I'm scared to go to hell thing. He needs to be number one. He needs, because what? It's the right thing. Because it's the right thing. I love that. Because it's the right thing. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. That's right. He's my refuge, my fortress. Psalms 91. John 16, 33. Guess who said that? It's in John. Jesus said, As I, I've said these things to you, that in me you have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. He's already overcome the world. So if you don't want your world to look like this, then you better have him in your world. Because he's already overcome it. That's it. Number four, verse 16. Preserve the teachings of God and entrust his instructions and follow him. Preserve his teachings. It's not just enough to know him, Chris. You got to know what he says. That's right. You know. I could use Cass as an example here, and I don't think that he would mind. Cass learned of his earthly parents, his biological parents, late in life. Very late. He he know he he found out about them. He's no he's he's got very little knowledge of them. He never had the opportunity to know their teachings. Am I correct, Cass? That's right. So there's a difference in knowing somebody and knowing their teachings. You can know Jesus. You can ask Jesus to come into your heart and be Lord of your life. But you've got to know his teachings. You've got to understand his ways. How do you do that? You've got to read his word. You've got to have a relationship. You've got to pray. You've got to seek him. It's not enough to come on Sundays and on Wednesdays and listen to me. That's my relationship. How did I get this word? Because I've got a relationship. I study. I ask. I seek. How does Cass know the words he gets? He studies. He asks. He seeks. How do you get a word? You study. You ask. You seek. It's good to get words from other people. It's good to glean from other people. But you've got to know yourself. It's the difference in me asking my sister, what did mom say? Because I'm scared to go ask mom myself. Right? Did mom say we could go? 
Or if I just go ask my mom, Mom, can I go? Because I'm going to know she's going to say yes or no. You know? Or ask my sister. My mom said, Ask God. You got to know his teachings. Five. <laughs> Four. Five. Verse 17. Wait for the Lord and put your hope in Him. Amen. There's a problem with freedom. <coughs> we ain't got no boundaries. We ain't got to wait. You know, if you're in a race, what's the, what would a what would a football game, game be like if there wasn't no time? How many of you would love to go to a football game if there was no time? I guarantee you, y'all would not go to football games if there was no time. No quarters, right? No halftime, right? It would be pointless. It would just go on forever until everybody was just exhausted or they just give up. Drop dead. Ball went flat. Something. Something would have to give for the game to just be over. <clears throat> or they would have to set a new rule. There would have to be some kind of a boundary for the game to be over. This is the same principle. The problem with freedom is we don't put no boundaries or no timing on anything. You want a new car? Oh, you just go ahead and go get a new car. We don't even put no time on is it the right time. You ever thought about that? Ooh. Hmm. What's the interest rates right now? Huh. Okay, so Abby does her homework. <laughs> Abby, if anybody needs some good timing information, you can, you can talk to Abby. But how many of us wait on timing to know whether the timing is right? The Bible says that before you build a house, you need to sit down and consider the cost. Amen. To make sure you've got what it takes. Or you're going to be foolish when you get halfway through it and realize, oh, uh, uh, I didn't have enough money to finish this thing. Or I didn't have enough material to finish this thing. Wait on the Lord. Do you know that you can have everything in line and everything can be perfect, but it may not be the right time just yet. Yes. That's why pastor says, it's not time. To have a pastor on salary in Love of Christ Ministries yet. Because God's not said it's time yet. That's right. Do we have a need for one? Could we afford probably a partial salary? Is it God's time? So what are we doing? Waiting. Because sometimes we have to wait on the Lord. You waiting on a significant other? Amen. Wait on God. Wait. You waiting to make a big decision in your life? Wait on God. Amen. You want to make a move? Wait on God. Wait on God, number five. Lamentation 6 or 326 says it's good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Part of that scripture, I like. Part of it kind of gives me the cringe because it says to wait quietly. In other words, oh, I cannot believe I'm still waiting. You ain't got to tell everybody what you're waiting on. Wait quietly on the Lord. Be patient. And wait on Him. The last thing, six. Ask Him for instruction and guidance. Verse 20. Look to God's instruction and teaching. People who contradict His word are completely in the dark. That's what verse 20 says. 
You want to know how to keep your life from looking like this and you need a way out? Ask God for his direction and instruction. Don't ask somebody whose life looks like this how to get out of your life from looking like this. Come on. Right. That's called a group huddle. I don't know much about sports, but I know that a team that's losing, and you get the whole team together that's losing, and they get into a team huddle, and they try to figure out how to quit, how to not lose. When they break from that huddle, they're still losing. If they don't pull somebody in off that sideline and seeing something from the outside to figure out why they're losing, they're still going to be losing. Don't ask somebody whose life looks like this how to keep your life from looking like this. That's it. Ask God for your instruction and direction of how to keep your life from looking like this. Ask for his guidance. Amen. Because then when your life becomes whole and that rope looks solid again, then when somebody else's life looks like this, they're going to come and say, Chris, how did you fix your life when it looked like this? Right. And then you can say there were six steps that I found in Isaiah. And do you want to know what those six steps was? <laughs> I find this amazing. I told you this was prophecy. The six steps... In Isaiah is basically prophecy of the plan of salvation that you find in Romans. Amen. All of these six steps that you find in Isaiah is basically narrowed down to that if you will ask the Lord to come into your heart, believe that He is the Son of God, and confess Him with your mouth, and you receive Him into your life, and make Him the Lord and Savior of your life, and live for Him. And sell yourself out to him and let him truly be your Lord and Savior. All six of these steps would be covered. That's right. Amen. And if he is truly your Lord and Savior, and you truly have got a relationship with him. A relationship. That's it. That's it. Not a one-time meet and greet. <clears throat> Sometimes people want to accept the Lord and that's a one-time meet and greet. But when you get up from that altar and it's a daily relationship, then every once in a while you may have a frayed edge, but that relationship mends it. Right? right? And we don't get to this point because a daily relationship keeps it mended. Now I ain't saying that you don't get bumps and scrapes and bruises and every once in a while sometimes a piece of that rope may shoot loose. But the daily relationship will keep it mended because the Bible says that a three-strand cord is not easily broken. Amen. So instead of a meet and greet, we have a relationship. So in Isaiah, we basically have a prophecy of what we find in Romans of the plan of salvation. So this morning, if you're needing a way out, let's stand to our feet this morning. This morning, if you're needing a way out, My answer to you is a relationship. 